All right, now welcome to episode 14 of the Lifestyle Chase. Today's guest is Michael Cameron. Now, I have some explaining to do. Today's podcast was recorded on the track of Millennium Place, so the entire time we're running at a pretty good pace. So my microphone's shaky at times. I hope that you enjoy this. Um, if you found value in this podcast, please share on social media. It really helps me out a lot in uh, increasing my reach and uh, making a bigger impact because when it comes down to it, I just want to help people be better people. So I hope you enjoy this episode and have a good day. Welcome to the Lifestyle Chase. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. Proudly hosted by me, Chris Little. Without further ado, let's get started. <laughs> We're at uh, Millennium Place on the track. I'm here with Michael Cameron for episode 14 of the Lifestyle Chase. So, welcome. Thanks, man. Glad to be here. How's your morning business? Well, so far, so good. Uh, it's going to be a little interesting with this. We got some Zumba going on here, but uh, no, the morning's been good. I, uh, I'm an early bird, so I was up nice and early, and actually working on uh, one of my videos. So, nice. oh, oh. you're a busy guy here, CEO, family man, philanthropist. Take us through a typical day in the life. Uh, I don't know that there is a typical day. If I can help it, pick the busiest day. There is definitely not a typical day, but uh, no, I try and get up at five every morning and get my workout in. I find, uh, you know, if I try and leave the workouts to the end of the day, they don't always happen. So, you know, usually I'm, I'm up early and Wednesday, Fridays is November project, uh, which starts at 6 a.m. Mondays, I try and get a 6 a.m. yoga in and uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I do a strength class uh, and then Sundays, Sundays typically a long run. Uh, then, you know, again, depending on the day, I head into the office and uh, I run a mortgage brokerage company. So my uh, commitment is to making stuff good for, my, for our mortgage agents. So I spend a lot of time, you know, there's just a variety of different activities, whether it's recruiting, working on our technology, giving back to the industry as a whole from uh, contributing on uh, the boards of our associations. So every day is a little bit different. And then of course, you know, there's kid activities and that's gotten a little bit easier as the kids get older. For sure. What's your favorite kid activity to do? Is it the sports? Is it the homework? Is it the um, trips? Yeah, certainly not the homework. <laughs> I'm not a homework guy. I, I absolutely love watching them, them play sports. Uh, the coolest thing, my son just turned 18, October 28th. So uh, my new favorite is he and I went out for a beer last nice. week. Where'd you go? Uh, we went to uh, the Canadian Brew House. What kind of beer did he try? He's a Budweiser guy. He's uh, uh, nothing too adventurous. What about yourself? Oh, I like IPAs. I'm an nice. IPA. Absolutely. But yeah, it was just... any of the local, local breweries? Yeah, I mean, I'm a big summertime. I'm a big Alley Cat, Apricot fan. Yeah. Have you heard of the new Polar Park Brewery? No. You should check it out. Yeah? Andrew Ferris is one of That's the Andrews? Shows. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I knew Andrew was working on something. I wasn't quite sure what it was called, though. And part of that is, uh, is named Polar Park. It's the same people that used to run Polar Park by Shirt Park with oh. the animals. Oh, okay. I did a blog post on it like six months ago. Uh, you can find that on uh, yagtweetup.ca. But super cool story. Super cool family, extremely ambitious, and their facility is going to have nitro brewing. So that's the first of its kind in Edmonton for sure. Oh, very cool. So kind of like uh, that Irish beer, Guinness. Oh, okay. Same idea. 
Yeah, I'm not a real big stout fan. I can't say that I am either, but I try all kinds. Yeah. No, I really like to try the different uh, strains of IPA. So many people don't like IPA. And no, they it's... pass it off to the next guy, kind of thing. It's definitely the an next guy. It's definitely an acquired taste, for sure. So, you've spoken at uh, TEDx shows, and you have a catchphrase that really stands out. It's, you're actually wearing on your shirt. Big, beautiful shirt. <laughs> yes. We're going to put out a teaser to our listeners. Um, in two sentences, how could you summarize the meaning of that team? We'll go into more detail in the next question. Yeah, I mean, the make beautiful shit happen thing was sort of a combination of a conversation my girlfriend and I had about uh, talent. And she asked me, or I asked her what her talent was, and she replied that she made things beautiful, and as an artist, she absolutely did. And she asked me what my talent was, and uh, she decided that my talent was that I make shit happen. And so together, we were going to make beautiful shit happen. I love it. So that's kind of the premise of where that came from. So kind of how our paths crossed is, I really think it was November Project. I haven't gone there nearly as much as you. Probably I've gone and accumulated like five times. Yeah. But then we got to add it connected on uh, social media. Yes. And I saw your video, your powerful story. And there's no question as to what video that is. Um, how, how has that day altered you and how has it made you the person you are today? Yeah, so you want me to describe the, the video that we're talking about? Yeah, give, give the listeners some context. Yeah, so in uh, October of 2015, uh, my girlfriend Colleen woke up at my place at 5 o'clock and went to go teach yoga at 6 a.m. She came around, gave me a kiss, said goodbye. I said, uh, have fun at yoga. And um, unfortunately, those were, those were the last words I ever said to her. She never made it to yoga. She was ambushed by an ex-boyfriend who shot and killed her and subsequently took his own life. So, I uh, put out a, a video challenging men to take the White Ribbon Pledge, which is I pledge to never commit, condone, or remain silent when it comes to violence against women. And, uh, you know, that coupled with, with the story um, has been a, a, a powerful, powerful message. And, you know, absolutely that day changed my life in a number of ways. You know, I uh, obviously lost a woman that I love very much in that moment, but it really sort of tested my mettle as far as overcoming adversity. And you know, I've been I've been through a lot of crap in my life, and uh, you know, you just never sort of expect to have to get to a point where we have to endure something like that. You know, for most people, it's just it's unfathomable. So yeah, it's absolutely sort of changed the the, the path of my life, no question. So if we took a time machine and went back 10 years, compared the 10 year ago version of you to the one today, <laughs> what would be the three biggest things that stood out? You know, I think for me, absolutely the biggest thing, 10 years ago, I was much more head focused than heart focused. And that's been a monumental shift in my life, you know, from a, doing things you know 10 years ago i sort of threw myself into into business and worked towards you know quote unquote success and uh, i think you know in hindsight 
probably lost sight a little bit of what success actually is. You know, I talk about how I've, I stopped goal setting. And the reason for that is because, you know, when you set goals, you uh, chase objectives that you think you want. And, you know, you risk being blinded by those goals or objectives. So, so I've switched to a framework of values, intentions, and milestones. And of course, milestones would be much more, you know, close to what you would consider a typical goal. But, you know, for example, way early in my career, in my 20s, you know, I was chasing that six-figure salary, right? And uh, why did I want that? Well, I wanted that so I could have more time with my family and do more things. But of course, you get so wrapped up chasing that goal that in fact, that takes away from spending more time with your family and doing more of the things you love. Um, and we get into this sort of vicious cycle and we tend to lose sight of what it is we actually want. Because nobody wants a hundred grand in the bank. They want what they think that will do for them. So, you know, maybe the way to get there is to earn a hundred grand. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's quitting your job and doing something you love. Maybe you can get to the same place without having to uh, sort of put that, those, those goal-focused blinders on. And I think that's really important. People are chasing emotions. It's tied to money. Yes. We realize we realize we're just going to push it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, the income one is, is huge, right? Because most yeah. of us, you know, whether it's I want a million dollars in my bank account, well, no you don't, because a million bucks doesn't do anything. Yeah. What you want is the freedom that you think that'll give you. You know, whether that's travel, whether it's time with the family, but in chasing that million bucks, again, you may potentially actually take away from time with the family. You may take away other opportunities. I've seen a lot of people lose themselves in the pursuit of money. And I find some of the most successful people I know are chasing their family values, feeling supported, feeling loved. That's really what brings success. The money will come. If you have to pay your bills, they'll be paid. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it's just, it's so easy to lose sight of it. In the, you know, we delude ourselves into thinking that once, once we do this, then we can do that. Yeah. And if you find yourself saying, well, once I X, then I can Y. I want you to stop and really challenge that. Yeah. Do you really need to wait for X before you can do Y? Or can you just do Y right now? Absolutely. And 90% of the time, I think you probably can. You know, we see it in business all the time. You know, once I get my new website up, once I get my new brochure yeah. put together, then I'll do this. Then I'll approach the big client. You know what? Forget that crap. How would just approach the big client? Agreed. Honestly, like, I was working at a gym across town. And it was great. And then they had to close. And I was thinking, well, what do I do? Like, I have to get more experience to start up my own thing or whatever. And I was like, no, I don't. Right. My clients just want to train with me. And then when I do a good job, more people will want to train with me. And honestly, I don't need to overthink it. I just need to set it up, find a gym, and do it. And it's worked. Yep, execution is the key. So you recently did a collaboration with Mr. David Proctor. Yes. In his Outrun Rare. Yes. Uh, it was like a charity run event. And it seems like every day you were doing video updates with him. But like he was running on the road, training conditioning, Showing his nutrition. Can you tell our listeners more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So Dave Proctor is a world record holder. He holds or held, I think it actually got recently broken, but he held the uh, Guinness World Record for farthest distance run on a treadmill in 24 hours. And uh, he has a 10 year old son that has, um, it's called RECA, R-E-C-A, relapsing 
encephalopathy with cerebellar ataxia. Ooh, not bad. Nice to um, So he was, uh, you know, his, his talent is running. So he decided he was going to run across Canada to raise funds and awareness for the Rare Disease Foundation. And uh, so, yeah, he set off to run from Victoria to St. John, Newfoundland. And unfortunately, he uh, ended up with a herniated disc just east of Winnipeg. But yeah, he ran about 2,700 kilometers from Victoria to just past Winnipeg and raised about $300,000 for the Rare Disease Foundation. And his journey got taken on by other people. Yes. Uh, logging so how many other people would you say participated? Oh, I'm not sure the number, but we basically, everybody was invited to pick up the mantle and, and sort of run for Dave and donate their kilometers. So they had, I can't remember the number, but I think it was like 60 or 70,000 kilometers donated. So it was actually really cool to see the run community get behind him once he couldn't run anymore and, uh, and support his cause. So it's, it's pretty cool to be, be a part of. And you know, there's another example of just the power of, of relationships. And I think that's a, a valuable lesson for your listeners. So and Dave has become a very good friend. Uh, but a year ago, I didn't know Dave. Exactly. I, uh, I ran into Dave via social media, saw he was doing some cool things. So I picked up the phone and called him and I said, hey, I said, would you be up for, uh, for an interview? Much like we're doing here, Chris. And uh, of course he said, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so I said to him, I said, well, I like to do things a little bit differently. <laughs> Whereabouts are you? And he was down in Okotoks. So I said, okay, well, you know, it's about a three hour drive. I said, how about I come to you? And uh, we do the interview somewhere that's meaningful to you. So long story short, we ended up doing it much like we're doing here at the Okotoks Fieldhouse. And I ended up running the track with him for about two and a half hours. Now, uh, the whole thing. Oh, these guys are nuts. It was, uh, it was amazing. And like I said, you know, that was, uh, that was a relationship out of me just picking up the phone and making an introduction. And like I said, Dave's become a very good friend and you know, I'm part of the Outrun Rare 2019 team. Oh, they, got some, they got some cool things coming. And uh, yeah, I mean, when he was running across Canada, we tried to do daily video updates of him on the road, which was really, really fun. It was really cool. Like, it's lucky that you're so tech savvy. Yeah. Because you got footage of him while he's doing this run. Yes, well, I, sp I actually sponsored uh, him to do it, and so I bought him what's called a gimbal. Yeah. That's the Steadicam, um, much like I'm holding right now, for his phone. So, yeah, we had him run with a, with a Steadicam while I interviewed him. So some days was uh, a little bit painful as he sort of hit those low spots. Yeah. But it was just really, really cool to share that experience. It's such a strong example of resiliency. Oh. Showing how it's the strongest not today. I still can't wait to record. Yes. So most of my guests actually have what I call an origin story. Yeah. Or at least how they grew up. So take us through what your childhood was like and try to match up some of the characteristics that make up who we are today. Yeah, you know what? I attribute everything I am today to the values my parents instilled in me. And I grew up in a very Christian values-based household uh, and you know while I've sort of I've fallen away from the church I'm not sure that's really my thing I mean those values I think are still there and that's the core right so yeah. from a parenting perspective I look at you know my kids and if we instill the right values in them then no matter how sideways they go, and I gotta tell you, man, I went fucking sideways in my teens, like big time. Um, in fact, I went so sideways, my parents shipped me off to Australia to live with my uncle when I was 16, because they couldn't, they didn't know what to do with me. Yeah. Um, 
But, you know, again, I attribute that foundation, those values that eventually brought me back. You know, I mean, I was doing drugs, drinking, stealing, doing all the shit I shouldn't be doing. Um, you know, and I was fortunate in that I survived those years. And yeah, and, uh, I almost didn't. I was in a very bad car accident in Australia when I was 17. I was in a coma for four days. I was probably a half an hour away from being dead. Uh, you know, so I sort of call that my, my TSN turning point. Exactly, that's what I call it too. But, uh, you know, truth be told, even that I'm not sure was a true turning point because at 17, you know, you still think you're invincible. And it's pretty easy to, to brush that aside and, uh, you know, get back caught up in, you know, what I now call the, the pursuit of badassery. <laughs> and, you know, you, meant, you referenced my TED talk, yeah. which, uh, you know, I talk about redefining badass, or I, I'm sort of calling it now breaking badass, and really redefining what, what it means to be a badass. And, you know, from a, a male standpoint, really what it means to be a man and sort of trying to break some of those stereotypical norms that I think can be very destructive. You know, it doesn't mean, doesn't mean that you, you can't love fast cars and motorbikes and badass shit. Exactly. But, you know, it's, for me, it's about having the courage to explore your feelings and emotions and allow yourself to be a little bit vulnerable and not always sucking it up you know and that became very evident after colleen was killed you know and i had many well-meaning friends surround me and pat me on the back and tell me to quote unquote be strong and you know the reality is i didn't want to be strong i wanted to curl up into a little ball and cry like a baby and you know, there are times when I did. Um, and I just think, you know, the way we think about strong is, is incredibly backwards. It's not about remaining stoic or suppressing or avoiding emotions. It's about having the courage to face your emotions head on, sit with them, observe them, and learn from them what we can. I completely agree with emotions unless we feel them, express them. People can't help us. We're never gonna be served. Yep. So it's important if you feel sad, you're sad. You're happy, you're mad, you're mad, but get it out. Yeah, well, and the other thing, I mean, when you talk about anger, I mean, one of the things that I strongly believe is that anger is often just a mask for sadness. Yeah. So really having the courage to explore that and look at what it really is. You know, as a, a sales and, and business leader, and a professional speaker, I always talk about, you know, sales and leadership stuff, and I talk about the impact that emotion has on human behavior. And uh, there's a host of science that suggests we make decisions based on emotion, justified by logic. So in sales, you know, we always teach our sales guys to make that emotional connection with their customer, because that's where the decision comes from. Um, and it's important to understand that, you know, if we don't understand the underlying emotions that drive the decisions that we make, we'll never have an opportunity to live a fully awakened existence. And exactly. as, yeah. as, as guys, I mean, I think, you know, that's historically been sort of frowned upon. Yeah, like guys, guys show emotion kind of thing. Hey, yeah, totally. Yeah. So I'm kind of known for my long Instagram posts for being emotional and vulnerable. But I think it makes me better. Yeah. And I think you're much the same way. We're kind of kindred spirits in that way. Yes. But back on that, when the fitness track, I guess it's easy to say. That fitness has always been like a catalyst for physical and mental growth. But was there ever a time that you didn't have fitness in your life? Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, again, growing up and in my teens, I was never the jock. And it really didn't start till, uh, you know, I did a marathon in 
My first marathon was 2003. Uh, my kids were three and one. And, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of did the one and done marathon and then it wasn't, you know, until another decade later when the kids were a little bit older. And in fact, I, uh, when I split with my wife, um, that I really got back into the fitness thing. And, you know, at that point I got into triathlon and I did Ironman and, you know, that's evolved now and I, I do uh, ultra marathons. So what's the longest distance you've ever run? 100 miles. Oh boy, it's crazy. Yeah. I don't think I could do that. 30, oh, absolutely you could. Well, I could. You just have to decide. I don't think that would be my goal. Yes. No, that was something else, man. I mean, you talk about testing your mental fortitude and your resilience. Yeah. I ran for 31 hours and 56 minutes. I watched the post. It's all the volunteer stations. You make it out. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I do. Every race I do, I try and do uh, what I call volunteer selfies. Yeah. So every aid station at every race, I'll take a selfie with a volunteer and post it. And uh, it's just, you know, it's been super cool. And then, of course, you know, usually I don't know these volunteers, but inevitably somebody will, will tag them on social. You know, yeah. hey, Chris, look, it's you. <laughs> and then we connect and then, you know, you just never know where that sort of evolves. And it's such a good way, like interaction is so important. Like with all of our social media and stuff, we tend to uh, downplay interaction and think of it as something that's not really worth it. Like right. holding the door for somebody, making eye contact and truly caring what they say back. Yes. When you say, hey, how's it going? Yep, well that's what I would call mindfulness and presence, right? Yeah. Just, and that's- there's so much in this growing online business, and less space time with people. Yeah, like but that's you know, backwards. But you know the beauty of that? Is it opens up a shit ton of opportunity it for does. those that have the courage to pick up the phone. So one of the things I do, or try and do, doesn't always happen, is uh, anytime I connect with somebody on LinkedIn, yeah. if they're relevant to my business, I'll pick up the phone and call them. Okay. You know, and people are always blown away. Of course, they're a little defensive at first because they, they think I'm phoning to sell them something. Yeah, some kind of pyramid And uh, yeah, I always joke that no, I just, uh, I try and connect with uh, three new people a day and today you're number two. Yeah. And that always gets a chuckle and of course breaks the ice a little bit. So uh, yeah, that, that human connection is huge. Totally. And you know, you look at suicide rates in, in men and again, this comes back to the being comfortable exploring emotions thing. I mean, I think men as a gender are generally incredibly lonely yeah and uh, you know we don't reach out we and play a role in the, the improvement it's mental health yes whether it's our own or else. yes absolutely well so it's got to start it's got to start with your own though yeah like somebody with a mess in front of the lawn can't be expected to do a good job Job and somebody else's body. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So I noticed that uh, yoga is kind of big role in yoga. Yes. What are the five biggest things that you gain from your yoga practice? Well, I think a large part of that has just been the practice of presence and mindfulness. You know, much like we alluded to just now. This is not something that you you just snap your fingers and you are. Yeah. It's a practice. And for me, yoga is just that ongoing practice of remaining present and mindful. Totally. And, you know, there's a physical aspect to it, but there's sort of that spiritual and mental aspect as well, which I find incredible. And it's just, it's really helped me to shift from head focused to heart focused. And how did you get into yoga? Um, you know, it's funny. It's one of those things that I think a lot of us 
you know, we sort of watch from the sidelines for a lot of years and we say, yeah, you know, I should try that one day. And I had a, a friend, actually an industry friend who was big into yoga. And uh, I poked her a couple of times and said, you know, I should go, I should really go. And then finally she said, okay, well, south side, Monday night, let's go. Yeah. So I went and just really enjoyed it. And from there made a commitment to stick to it. And you know, it's cliche, but it's absolutely changed my life. Sure. And you know, whether it's yoga for, for your listeners or something else, yeah. I mean, I think you need to find something that gives you that time to practice that mental clarity and practice that being... What's your favorite kind of yoga? Uh, well, I go to the Moksha studio out here. I, mean, yeah. I really like the flow yoga. So they which, recently did a name rebrand. Yes. What's your name? Moto. Ah, nice. Do you know the meaning of Moto? Uh, I don't. I actually looked it up because because I was curious when they made the name change, but I don't recall. Yeah. Um, but no, it's just, you know, in that community, it had become a bit bit of a family to me. For you sure. Know, Colleen was killed on a Friday. I went into the studio on Saturday, and I was just absolutely swarmed with love. And yeah. It was, it was amazing, so. That's the importance of community in the fitness industry. Yes. And I'm a big advocate of that. Whether it's my own clients, or places where I go, around the people that I come across on Instagram, making sure people know that you care. Yes. Genuinely. Yeah, and it doesn't take a lot, right? Like, it doesn't have to be these big monumental things. It can just be, you know, as little as remembering the name of that guy or gal that serves you your coffee at Starbucks or Tim Hortons every morning, right? Sure. So if I said you had to run one park in the MS area for the rest of the year, which park would that be? Oh, one park. You know, I I, uh, I have a bit of an affinity to the science park, Strathcona Science Park. Yeah. And, you know, into that sort of gold bar area. I really like that. I don't know, it's tough to pick one. So, when balancing family and work and all those things, what are the things that you instill into your day to day to make it happen that you have that balance between all of the important facets, your important values in your life? What are the ways that you instill that balance and make it stay? Ah, uh, you know, that's a great question. One of my least favorite words is the word balance uh, because I think it suggests that we can portion off the different components of our life yeah. and have the right proportion of each. Yeah. And in reality, I'm not sure that's feasible because, you know, that would suggest that, you know, if I work from nine to five, I work from nine to five and I shut everything off at 5.01 and vice versa. When I hit the office at 9 a.m., I leave all the shit that's happening at home, at home. And again, I don't believe that's possible. So what I try and do, and this comes back to yoga a little bit, is it, it's those integrations, the transitions in between, right? So in yoga, you move from pose to pose, but it's really about breathing through those transitions. And in life, I'd say it's the same thing. So for me, it's about integrating rather than balancing. So I try and integrate all the different facets of my life together rather than try and balance them. Absolutely. And you know, you may call that semantics, but for me it just, from a mental shift, it, it works really well. So, you know, again, to expect that if I'm having a crappy day at work or there's some stress at the office that to think that that's not going to come home with me is ridiculous. So if I bring it home with me, you know, just even, you know, I do this with my kids now more and more as they get older, I explain to them, you know, look, I had a shitty day. Yeah. Or I've got some stresses going on at the office. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm short with you, 
call me out on it because I don't mean to be, but you just you need to understand that this is where this might be coming from, and you know not to make an excuse for poor behavior, but if everybody understands where everybody's mental space is, it makes it that much easier to work together. So, so yeah, again, much like yoga, it's it's about finding those transitions and really being mindful of the transitions and breathing, so to speak, through those transitions as we move from, you know, fitness to work, to home, to relationships. And the reality is, you know, all of the concepts come into play, whether I'm talking about, you know, making a sale at work or fostering a stronger relationship with my kids. Absolutely. It's all relationships. And, uh, you know, the quality of your relationships is really the quality of your life. So by focusing on how do I build better relationships across the board, um, you know, I think that's where we start to really excel. So what would you say are the three most influential opportunities in your life right now? You know, I, uh, I struggled with that a little bit when you sent me that question. I'm not quite sure how to answer that. I mean, again, there's some great guys in the run community. There's Steve Chorba, Steve Baker. have become really good friends over the last few years. Yeah. And uh, guys I would definitely lean on and I look up to, you know, both doing inspiring things in their own right. The qualities that they embody that you want to take on in your own life. You know, again, I, th I think it's just sort of living your values. Yeah. From what I see and, and, and pursuing your passions. Absolutely. You know, whether that's running, whether that's art in Stephen Chorba's case, um, you know, it's, it takes a lot of courage to, to do that. So, for sure. So yeah, I mean, I think courage is, is sort of the big one. Yeah. And, and for me, courage is kind of the be all and end all. We often, you know, there's books written on fearlessness and yeah. things like that. And I think that's such bullshit because- Buzzwords. Well, and the reality is, I don't think you're ever gonna be fearless. Yeah. What you need to be is courageous. Or which means- attitude around fear needs to change. Yeah, you just need to be able to move through your fear. I don't think you need to, I don't think it's reasonable to try and eliminate fear, but I think it's reasonable to try and find ways to move through that fear and not let it cripple you and paralyze you. So yeah, you know, a couple of guys in the run community for sure. Um, I've got a lot of connections sort of outside the city that I look up to. Good friend of mine, uh, Drew Dudley. He's a leadership expert and uh, you know he and I have shared some some personal stories that uh, have really resonated and brought him really close as well so he's he'd be another guy although not an Edmontonian definitely a guy I value in my life for sure and you know industry colleagues and and even competitors yeah um, I just look for the the, the people that live their values. Absolutely. So now for some quick questions. First one, cookies or donuts? Haha, <laughs> cookies for sure. Kale or spinach? Spinach, absolutely. Movie in a theater or a high school drama production? I would definitely take drama production. I can't Attaboy. stay awake at a movie theater. <laughs> the kids will keep you interactive. Yes. Love it. Back to the long answer. If the listeners want to find out more about you or what you're all about, where should they go? Uh, MikeCameron.ca is kind of my home for everything online. As you all know, I share pretty much everything on uh, social, so Facebook. I'm under Michael Cameron on Facebook. But uh, yeah, that's probably the best bet. Yeah. You can Google my TEDx, Redefining Badass. Uh, I'm kind of all over the place. You're not too Sorry? You, you're an author. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not published yet, but yes, that's uh, that's one of those things that I keep kicking myself for. I uh, 
I banged out 100,000 words and am on the final throws of editing. But uh, I just need to buckle down and get that sucker done. And at least people know to keep their eyes open, hey? Yes, absolutely. If you yeah, book a trailer, what would it be? Uh, well, much like what we've talked about, I mean, for me, it's all about sort of breaking badass. Yeah. And, you know, my entire life, I've pursued that sort of handle of badass as a guy that was always more geek than jock in high school, uh, or when I dropped out of high school. But, um, you know, I've always sort of looked for, for ways to sort of prove myself, so to speak. And, yeah. you know, I've been relatively successful in business in my uh, in my 40s and you know now it's about moving from success to significance so that's kind of what I try you know it's I tell sort of my life story and some of the trials that I've had to go through and and uh, how those have shaped me and the lessons that readers can learn from that so yeah again it's it's all about reshaping some of those stereotypical norms. I love it. So now for the most important question. If you were to give our listeners one piece of advice on how to live their life the most, most authentically, what would that piece of advice be? Yeah, be you. Authenticity is huge. So stop trying to prove to the world how good you yeah. are and start trying to prove to yourself how much better you can be. Yeah. And just own your shit. I yeah. love it. We're gonna start walking to cool down. <laughs> Thanks for joining me, Mike. Uh, my pleasure, fun. man. I'll see you around soon, I'm sure. Absolutely. <sighs> <Ha>! <laughs> Is that a good workout for you? Totally, that was my second one of the day.